So I'm going to share a little bit about the Giving Keys origin story. And then I'm actually going to share uh, parts of my personal story and how that kind of intersects with the Giving Keys, which I don't actually get to talk about that much. So I'm really excited to get to that part. But to start off, um, I just want to share a little bit about what we do. And I'm actually going to do that through a video so you can see a little bit from our founder, Caitlin Crosby, as well as some of our staff. So here we go. This is the best job that I've ever had. And the fact that I engrave inspirational words for people, I'm actually engraving a, a key that somebody is wearing. The Giving Keys resonates with people because we employ people that are trying to transition out of homelessness. I was walking on Hollywood Boulevard and I saw a, a young homeless couple. I said to the girl, I like your necklace. And she said, oh, thanks, I like making jewelry. So the next day I went to the locksmith and I bought engraving equipment and started paying this couple to engrave the keys with different inspiring words. Little by little they started saving up enough money to get their own apartment. Now we have over 35 employees and it's creating second chances for people. It's a whole pay it forward concept. So if you have a key that says strength on it, you're supposed to own your word and then you have to pass it on to somebody you feel needs the message on the key more than you and then tell them they have to pass it on to somebody that needs it more than them. The main word that I will put on my kid is faith. I have faith now in my ability to be able to be positive, to be productive. Strong. If there's going to be a struggle, I will have to still be strong. This is what it's all about. Regardless of our stories, we all need words of hope. And that's what makes us all a family. So, that's what I get to do every day. And I'm so grateful that Caitlin took the step to start this sort of crazy idea. Can you imagine if she went to uh, pitch a group of investors at the beginning of this and say, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to stamp words on keys. We're going to put them on chains. We're going to sell them. And then we're going to teach homeless people how to re-enter the workforce. It's a pretty crazy idea when you just hear it without seeing like all the behind the scenes that goes into it and, and seeing how it's already af effective at changing people's lives. Um, I'm really grateful to be a part of this. I've worked at the Giving Keys for six years now. My work anniversary was September 9th. Um, but Caitlin did something uh, really, really courageous in, in stepping out and starting this idea. And I think what's really cool about her story as the founder is that she started off as an actress and a musician. Her dad was a talent manager in Hollywood. She spent her whole life growing up in the, the industry in LA. And... Um, sort of saw herself going down that path. She never intended to start this business. And if there's any encouragement that I think you can take from her story, um, her founding story of the Giving Keys, it's that you can start with what you have. You can start with the resources that you already have, and you can create something that is really impactful. Um, it just takes a little bit of creativity and grit and, and a lot of hard work to get it off the ground. But we've never taken capital. Uh, we've done a little bit of debt financing, but this has all been, this, the scale of the company has all come through the sales and reinvesting those profits into the company. Um, so you don't always have to have a ton of money to get something off the ground. You can start small. And that's what she did. Um, so I, wa I want to talk about why this is such an important idea. And for those of you that are living in Southern California, I'm sure that you see this homeless crisis. Um, if, if you don't, I would encourage you to come down to Skid Row and drive through and see what is going on with that population. Um, there's a homeless count that happens every year. 
and uh, it happens in January and teams of volunteers go out and our team has participated in this. Um, teams go out and drive different parts of LA County and they actually look for folks that are sleeping on the sidewalk, folks that are sleeping in their cars and RVs and tally up the number of people that they see experiencing homelessness, which sounds really strange uh, to, to kind of drive around and count people. It feels almost a little dehumanizing, but it's actually a really important exercise for uh, determining where certain funding is going to be distributed to help create solutions for homelessness. So if you're interested in participating in that, I can definitely share more information with you. But the, the main reason why this idea has continued on and the main motivation for our team and why we keep moving this thing forward is this number. 53,000 people experiencing homelessness in LA County. That number has grown. Um, this is actually the first year in four years that that number has decreased. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one of them being that they've really invested in solving veteran homelessness. And so they've seen a significant reduction in homeless veterans because of the, the intentional concerted effort that they've put in that population and getting that population housed. But for, th for three years, uh, that number grew by anywhere between 12 and 23%. So we have an affordable housing crisis and we really believe at the Giving Keys that one of the ways to solve homelessness is through employment. People need a paycheck to afford a place to live, there's so many more benefits aside from just that paycheck in their pocket, creating a sustainable lifestyle for them. Um, dignity, restoration of families, restoration of self-value and self-worth, um, just to name a few. I mean, I think those things are actually significantly more important than a roof over your head, but a roof over your head, we all need that too, to be able to function. So. The number one cause of homelessness is actually the loss of a job. Isn't that interesting? I think we have these stigmas about why we think homelessness happens. And a lot of us would probably assume it's by choice. Somebody wants to do drugs or gets involved in criminal activity. But what if somebody lost their job and couldn't afford to maintain their rent? And because of that, they don't have an address when they go to apply for their next job. And then they're counted out of the running in, the, in that candidate pool because they don't have an address. There's a whole sort of cycle or downward spiral that people can get into because of one major financial change in their life. So this is why we do what we do. This is a really big issue and LA has been named, unfortunately, the homeless capital of the United States. So now more than ever, this is really important for us to address this problem. So I want to talk a little bit about how our impact model works. We are not the experts in direct client services for the homeless population. I will say after 10 years of uh, being in existence, we've definitely learned a lot of things about what this population needs, how to serve them as best as we possibly can. But a lot of that knowledge and experience has come through our really valuable partnerships. So the jobs that we provide, you saw in the video, are the, the entry kind of point into the giving keys for this population is that they are brought in on our production team. So those jobs include stamping keys, assembling jewelry, um, doing logistics, so working in our like shipping systems and packing orders, doing quality control. So the way we fill those positions is we actually build partnerships with people that are working with people experiencing homelessness and they identify candidates that would be a good fit for our team. They send those folks over to us for interviews. We bring them in for a two week trial, paid trial, and determine if it's the right fit. And then over the next three to six months, we kind of do a deeper uh, exploration of culture fit, readiness for a long-term position at the company. And then we have this really cool moment, which I'll, I'll show you later in the slides, um, where we, st we actually stole this tradition from Chrysalis. 
um, which is a, a workforce development agency for people that are low income or experiencing homelessness. They do this cool ceremony that's called a bell ringing. So anytime one of their clients gets a full-time job anywhere, they do this huge celebration where the person gets to ring a bell. They invite their entire staff. They invite the new employer's entire staff to come. And it happens in the lobby of their building where other clients that are starting the job readiness program are sitting and working on their resumes, and um, they get to hear the, the, the new employee ring the bell and give a speech about the program, what they got out of the program, and it's just a beautiful sort of pay it forward moment. It's, it's, it's really cool to see folks go through that job readiness training, commit to the job, and then get to the point where they're being hired and then inspire other people that are in that program to do the same thing. So lots of tears happen in those moments and the speeches are always amazing. I'm like, can you teach me how to be a better public speaker? I am blown away by how articulate and um, thoughtful our, our team members are in, in sharing their own stories. Uh, Skid Row Housing Trust is actually building permanent supportive housing units. So we've worked with them to place a few of our folks in housing. Um, they work primarily in downtown LA, but they've got locations in other parts of the county. Uh, first place for youth, we work with them on a youth internship program. So they're working with homeless foster youth, kids that are aging out of the foster care system and don't have... Uh, a job lined up or are not getting the extension on AB 12, which gives them a stipend to help them with the cost of living in Los Angeles. So we give them an opportunity to uh, get some job skills under their belt. Uh, a lot of them decide to go into some sort of education program. So we're kind of setting them up with their first resume building experience. So it's really fun working with those those kids. And then Downtown Women's Center is another partner. We actually just extended our partnership portfolio and we've brought in about six more partners that are providing direct client services. So we wanted to do that to really engage not only on uh, with agencies that are working in downtown LA, but also on the west side. Because if you have been to Venice recently, um, I actually call it like the Skid Row satellite site because there's essentially the same experience you would have driving through Skid Row. There's now a, a, a location in Venice, which ironically is right outside the Google offices, um, which that's a whole other thing, um, where people are living in tents. So Venice is working really hard on finding a solution to create like a bridge housing opportunity for those folks. Um, so there's a lot more partnerships that we brought into the mix. But we really couldn't do it without these people because um, when Caitlin first met the first homeless couple, which actually, I'll, let me share that story because, um, did she mention it in the video? No? Okay. There's a version of the video where she talks about it. I didn't want to repeat that story. Um, Caitlin was on tour and making these keys and selling them at her merch table. And a, a really funny part of the story is that the keys were selling out more than her records. So she was like, hmm, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, so she actually created a promotional deal where if you bought a key, you got a CD. Because she's like, just get the music. I want you to buy the music too. Um, so it's a really funny part of her story. But uh, she was on tour selling these keys, having a locksmith stamp them for her, and then she was assembling them herself and um, selling them herself. She went to an Invisible Children documentary screening in Hollywood, and she walked out of the venue just like full of inspiration and this feeling like, I have to do something for somebody tonight. Like I can't, I don't want to go to my acting class. I want to do something that feels like alive and it's for someone else. And she, as she was walking back to her car, she actually saw this young homeless couple named Rob and Sarah. And they were holding a sign that said, ugly, broke, and hungry. And Caitlin, uh, this is definitely just a part of the, her being and the way she operates in the world, um, stopped for them and asked them their story. 
And I want to like pause on that really quick because I think I get a lot of questions sort of working in the homelessness space about what people can do. It's like this huge issue. You see that number 53,000 people, like what could I possibly do to resolve that or support that? Um, do I give money? What Like giving your time and your conversation and your eye contact and your acknowledgement of hello person sitting on the sidewalk that is holding a sign begging for money. I see you and I care enough about you to just stop and ask you how your day is going. I think that is a beautiful way to engage with the issue of homelessness. And that requires nothing of you except for some of your time. Um, so that would be one of my encouragements to you just on specifically on how do you address the issue of homelessness. So Caitlin stops for this couple um, ends up taking them to dinner. And over the course of the dinner, they're talking about their life story. And Caitlin compliments Sarah's necklace. And Sarah's response to that compliment was to say, thank you. I actually made this. I, I make jewelry. It's one of my hobbies. And it was this light bulb moment for Caitlin where she's like, oh my gosh, I have this locksmith stamping these keys. I'm stringing in these necklaces myself while still trying to be a touring musician. You are living in a dumpster. Can I just pay you to do this? It sounds like that would be a benefit for both of us. And they were like, sure, we'll take a job. That's great. So literally the next day they met up at Pet Boys and bought the engraving kit and the hammer and they started stamping the keys for her. And so she would pay them for each key that they stamped uh, that was good enough quality to be sold. And little by little, they saved up enough money to move out of the dumpster into a motel and then into an apartment. And long story short, um, Rob was originally from Seattle. While he was working for the Giving Keys, he got his GED tested in the 90th percentile, moved back to Seattle to go to college. Like, let's soak that in for a second. He was living in a dumpster got his GED because he got a job and felt inspired to re-engage his life. Moved back to Seattle to where he was from to re-engage with that part of his life and then goes to college. Like that is a really big transformation that happened in less than two years. Um, and then Sarah was originally from San Diego. She was actually born into homelessness. Her parents lived under an underpass um, along the five freeway. And she um, had a daughter and she moved back to San Diego after working with Giving Keys for a while, got a job at the San Diego Zoo, reconnected with her daughter and set up a whole life for herself there. So they effectively became the first graduates of what would become the Giving Keys Employment Program. But at that point, Caitlin was just like, this is just an outpouring of compassion for these individuals that she met. There wasn't this like grand plan of we're gonna become a $10 million company and we're gonna employ 100 people transition, like none of that. It was just, uh, I see a need and I wanna be resourceful and creative about how to meet it. Um, so I think that's a really beautiful part of the story. Um, so we've gone from Rob and Sarah, this initial couple, to now having created over 100 jobs for people transitioning out of homelessness. And there's some really, really, really incredible stories. Um, and I believe my next slide actually shares a quote. So that bell ringing ceremony that I mentioned this is a quote from one of our staff members on the day of his bell ringing. He shares, today symbolizes the first day of a good movement that I've made in my life. And I'm very happy because everyone was here to support me. It seemed like when I had graduation as a kid, there were always people who didn't make it. Today I graduated everything at one time and all my family was here to see it. Nobody missed it and I'm overjoyed by that. I think a really important part of um, 
our mission and the way that we approach it is about the kind of culture that we create within our team and within our office space. So a lot of, um, a lot of agencies, they're dealing with such a high volume of clients that they, they don't have any other choice but for it to be um, somewhat of a machine. And I think case managers have way too many people that they have to um, support and that ratio is imbalanced. It can become really challenging to build authentic relationships, but we have been really committed to this idea that we're not only a place where you're gonna learn job skills, you're also coming to a place that's gonna be very vocal about affirming your strengths, identifying and helping form your identity, and not holding your past against you. Um, I think one thing that I would love to see and I would love to inspire for anyone in the room that is a business owner, um, consider being a felony friendly employer. That might sound scary for some people. Um, we actually don't do background checks <laughs> on our folks because we know that most of them are coming to us with some kind of record. And we really feel like it's our mission and our purpose to not be blind to that, but to see the person, know that they have a past. And yes, we find out their story pretty early on in the relationship, but to, to look at them and say, yeah, we see all of that and we accept you here. And I really believe that um, our expectations of people have a certain gravity to them. When you start to expect a certain type of response out of somebody, they're much more likely to give you that kind of response. Um, so I think a lot of our work is in helping people walk out of shame and embarrassment around their choices or around things that happen to them and to feel powerful and worthy of a better life. And one, one of the stories kind of in that regard, we had this beautiful woman who, uh, she's actually going to court tomorrow to, to finalize regaining custody of her kids, which is incredible. Um, she started working for us and it's very normal in our culture to um, like compliment people if you came into our office, you would kind of notice pretty quickly that it's a very encouraging space and we do that on purpose. Um, and, and I wanna say like, that is not fluffy stuff. That, that creates a space that allows transformation to happen. And it's not something we do just to feel good. It's something that we have tested and tried and have seen the power of positive, words being spoken to someone consistently daily to really transform the way that they see themselves and they start to function differently because they see themselves differently. So this woman started working for us and um, a lot of these folks don't have a lot of clothes, clothing options. Um, a lot of them don't have very nice clothes, but when they come to us um, and you can tell that they've put effort into how they look that day because it's their job and they want to show up well for it. Just affirming and saying, oh my gosh, you look so beautiful today. I love your hair pulled back or that sweatshirt's really cool. There are pe like the people on our team have not received a compliment in so long. Some of them haven't received a compliment like ever, depending on their family of origin. Um, so I remember this woman on our team we do team meetings every Monday morning and we, it's very interactive and conversational. And so we asked, or I asked her to share and like, how has your first two weeks been here? And she was like, I, I, f I feel beautiful. I feel beautiful for the first time in my life. No one has ever told me that I'm beautiful, beautiful before. And I've had like multiple people tell me that. Um, and she's like, and the crazy thing is I actually believe it. Th 
that piece plus the job skills plus the soft skills, like that's the whole package. And that's what we're trying to create for folks. Um, and now she's like this super confident person. She went and did, uh, we partner with Pepperdine Microenterprise Program. Five of our team members have gone through that program. It's specifically tailored for people that are transitioning out of homelessness as well. And they do a, an incubator and a pitch night and can raise money for their businesses. She actually got her business funded. She's graduated from the Giving Keys. She's living with four kids off of what she's making from her cleaning business in three years. Went from not having custody of her kids, was fresh out of prison, um, hadn't had a job in probably a decade, and now she's running her own company. It's pretty crazy and beautiful. Um, in addition to the uh, homelessness mission, you saw the story of the woman who had the sick daughter and the key that was given to her. And I love the part where Darnell talks about getting to hit those inspirational words every day as like the core function of his job. So for somebody who's been in a really hopeless state to have to stamp the word hope like over and over and over again, I think is a really powerful thing. But this, I think we've, this number is a little outdated, but we've collected over 3,000 stories of people who have given their keys away, um, which actually, compared to the amount of keys that we've sold, I would love for this number to be higher. We're trying to figure out ways to like engage people to get to share their stories in an in easier way. Um, we've sold a little over a million keys, so we would love to see this number go up. If you have a giving key and you give it away, share your story on Instagram with us. Um, but you can go on our website and actually pull our blog up and read the stories of the keys being given away. And one of the ones that, I mean, Erica's is really powerful, um, but there's another story of a daughter that bought a strength key for her mom who was going through chemo treatments and that mom wore that strength key while she was in that process. She ended up, thank God, going into remission. And because of the intensity of those chemo treatments and being in that cancer ward, she built relationships with other people going through that same experience and gave her key, her strength key, to somebody else in the cancer uh, ward. And that person wore that key and embraced that strength as they were going through their process, went into remission and paid it forward to somebody else. And it happened like three or four times. And of course, I'm not saying like, we have magic keys and they will heal you. That's not what I'm saying at all. But there's something about the symbolism of the word and having a daily reminder, having that token um, to hold on to, that's a real anchor point. Um, I'll be going throughout my day and I have my key on and um, this one says create. But just to have that reminder of like, oh yeah, I have the power to create or I am a creative person or whatever message I want to be embracing in that moment around the word create. It's just a really powerful thing to have the daily reminder. Um, so that's a, a very, very important part of our business. And a lot of people, um, yes, want to support the mission of creating jobs for people transitioning out of homelessness. But I think to have that personal connection to a product is also really, really important. And I, and I don't want to neglect that part of the story, although I tend to lean more heavily into our homeless mission. Um, this is such a significant part of our business. And it's one of the reasons why we've been so successful um, because you have to have a product that people want to engage with. Um, and a lot of people wear their word and they give it away and they're like, okay, I gotta get my next word. And um, there's almost like a repeat customer built into the mix. So it really started with a key on a chain, but over time we expanded into other types of jewelry. So we've got earrings and bracelets, the color strands. You can see the strands that we've got outside. 
available. We've done some t-shirts as well. Um, and then this is a really fun part of our evolution as a business. Um, we got this Airstream and gutted it, renovated it, turned it into a mobile store, and we've been driving this thing all over California, um, slanging keys at malls, at music festivals, and we intentionally made it a chalkboard paint exterior so that people could come and write their pay it forward stories on the outside. So it's really important that we have those engagement moments with our customers. And then this is a, a picture of our founder at Nordstrom when we did a trunk show there. Um, I'm going to share another video about our retail store. Um, actually, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that now. There are 53,000 people in Los Angeles County currently experiencing homelessness. In a city known for the bright lights, for many, the future can seem pretty dark. But we believe that this storefront can be a shining beacon in the Arts District, adjacent to Skid Row, close to the shelters. Because in the last 10 years, we've employed over 100 people transitioning out of homelessness and created over 133,000 hours of meaningful work. This place, it would change you if you work here long enough. Because what we do, we basically sell hope. That's what we do here. When people know that you're homeless, they tend to look away because what it is is they want to help you, but you know what, they don't have no clue what the, how to start. With the Arts District undergoing so much new development and things are getting more and more expensive, we want to make sure that it's not just a place where people of means are driving by all the tents off Skid Row on the way to their favorite restaurant, but this is a place where they can come and actually invest in the issue of homelessness by purchasing our inspirational products. They're like, oh, really? Okay, we, we heard about the giving kids, but we never actually had a chance to interact with a person that actually worked at Giving Keys. We put together the keys that say inspire, hope, love, dream. So the other part of our mission is to not only embrace your inspirational word, but to pass it on, to pay it forward to somebody else you feel needs the word on the key more than you. And then we have this whole wall, it's a pay it forward wall, so you can come in, write the story of how you got your key or why you gave it away. So it's this whole wall of inspiration. When you know people care about you, it's real easy to care about someone else. It is. A lot of people, they're messed up because society or the things that they went through in life tricked them into thinking that nobody cared about them. And see, that's the key. When, when you know that you have someone to care about you, it, it makes a lot of difference in the world. This is a place where people's stigmas around the issue of homelessness will fall away because they will be so connected to it. And this really will be a hub of inspiration and hope for everybody, realizing that we're all in this together. So you're all invited to come shop your hearts out. And I think uh, this, is, this is a good time to just touch on why I think, why, why I love our model. Um, I grew up a pastor's kid in the suburbs of Detroit, and I definitely had the desire to do something impactful with my life and somehow be of service to people. And I thought that that needed to look like going into ministry or working for a nonprofit. And what this model does is it's financially sustainable. We don't have to ask people for money to keep it running. We just sell more things. And it's a way for customers to feel like they can engage with an issue um, in a way that's fun for them. And I'm not saying, I, I think nonprofits are totally important. And 
Uh, I don't think it's a, a bad model to, to fundraise and, and take donations. But I do think that there's something really powerful about creating these for-profit ideas that allow for transformation in people's lives um, to happen in a financially sustainable way. And I think this is, I think we're really on the precipice of this being a more common approach to addressing social issues. And so my, my husband worked at Tom's for six and a half years and that's how we met was through this kind of like social enterprise connection. And um, we both really believe that these cause oriented for-profit structures are, are really the way of the future. And that might sound like a bold statement, but I really believe it. Um, I have a lot of friends that run nonprofits and fundraising is hard and you have to spend a lot of time going out, pitching to your donors, asking for money, asking for money, asking for money, and you don't get to spend as much time developing your programs. And this is something that allows us to stay really focused on developing our employment program. Um, so I just think it's a really great way to approach social issues. Um, this is a picture of our, our team. Um, but to kind of go back to, to my, my origin story, um, I grew up a pastor's kid, thought I needed to go into like ministry or nonprofit. I ended up going to India when I was 17 years old. And there was a really pivotal experience for me um, where I walked out of a cafe in Mumbai and to my left, there was a little girl, probably six or seven years old, holding an infant. She had one full leg and one half leg, the, the six or seven year old did. Um, and she was begging for money for the two of them. And I was watching people just walk by. And I'm like, what is happening here? This is a child. How is this possible? Why is no one stopping for her? What is going on? And this, like my justice button got like punched. And I was like, this is crazy. How is this, how is this happening? Um, so I came back from that trip and I told my mom, we're going to start a nonprofit and we're going to raise money and I'm going to throw benefit concerts because my boyfriend at the time was in a band and that was like the only, that was like Invisible Children was doing benefit concerts all the time. And so I was like, this is a great way for us to raise money. So we started raising money and sending it over to, um, some, some folks in India that were building safe houses for kids that were getting rescued out of brothels. So that was sort of my first, um, foray or attempt to engage with an issue. Um, I, at the end of my senior year, was pretty dead set on going back to India and working at an orphanage. And I ended up having some really interesting conversations with some friends of my parents who um, really encouraged me to think about my strengths and the natural passions that I had and, and like take that into prayer and see what could come of that. Um, and I hadn't thought about it that way before. I really loved fashion and I just never thought it, it kind of felt like vapid or superflu superfluous. Like you can't really have a career in fashion and be like having an impact, a positive impact on the world. Um, but over the course of those conversations, I, I started to really like warm up to that idea. And little by little, I applied for fashion school. Um, fashion school took me to London one day when I was riding the tube to class, the tube, if you're actually from the UK, the tube. Um, I was sitting there just kind of doing my thing, waiting to get off the train. And I see a magazine next to me and I pick it up and open it. And there's this feature on Allie Hewson, Bono's wife. And they had just started this ethical fashion company called Eden. And I'm sitting there reading this article and like tears just welling up. And I'm like, this, what is this? This is like the perfect intersection of the things that I love, 
there's not a model out there. This is in 2005 before like Tom's or any of these companies existed. This was the first time I was seeing a model like in action doing something impactful. Um, and they were working with African farmers and dealing with things on a policy issue to make sure that the workers were being treated well. Um, so I sort of like had this mindset that I was going to do something like that. And um, there's a lot more to that story. London was a really pivotal time in my life. Um, it's where I learned about a, a guy named William Wilberforce, who some of you might be familiar with. Um, he was really, really involved in the abolition of the slave trade. Um, I lived in Clapham where he and his friends sort of convened um, around their ideas. And I love this idea of people being in community, being value centered, um, having their faith motivate their choices, but being highly engaged with culture and highly engaged with the issues of the day. And he was definitely an inspiration for me as I moved forward in my, my career. So I came back from London and continued to do um, fashion things, making my own line of dresses and working in Detroit public schools doing fashion after school programs. And then um, I knew that I wanted to focus more on the business side versus the design side. So I started applying to schools and I got into FITM, the Fashion Institute in downtown LA, got a scholarship, made it to LA. And Caitlin and I ended up meeting through a mutual friend right when she was starting the Giving Keys. And very long story short, I felt like because I had this intention of, I wanna do something in the fashion space that intersects with, philanth intersects with philanthropy, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but I want to learn everything that I can about the fashion world. I really, each job that I had kind of leading up to the giving keys was this really awesome like preparation for what I was going to step into. And I really believe that was God kind of guiding each one of those steps and preparing me for that opportunity. Um, so that's, that's how Caitlin and I met and, uh, the, the day that my employer, I, before I started working for the Giving Keys, the day my um, employer laid off half of the staff, um, I got a text from Caitlin saying, oh my gosh, my production manager just quit. I need somebody. Do you know of anybody? You're in the fashion space. Do you know somebody that could do this? And it was like perfect timing. And I, I wrote her back. I was like, how about, how about me? Um, so I also want to like share that as an encouragement to Preparation is super important and being intentional is very, very important, but there's also a surrender in the process that the right things are going to come at the right time. And um, I really believe that things are ordered for our, our good and our development. And um, for those of you that might feel like Oh, I just want to get started. Like, keep trying and don't. I worked super hard that whole time, but also know that there's going to be times when the timing just works out. Um, so, yeah, I think I've gone a little bit over. I'm going to wind it down. I think we're going to do a little QA. But thank you so much for listening that whole time. So fun to share with you. So, so your journey is, is one of discovering that business can be a ministry. It is a form of ministry. It's an avenue of ministry. You know, when you walked into our lobby today, I don't know if someone pointed it out to you, but uh, there's a big um, banner in there that says the Kroll School of Business, business as ministry. Mm. And i uh, I remember the first time I walked into that lobby quite a few years ago and saw that, and it was like, why, why is that a jarring thought? Mm. You know, you don't necessarily see business and ministry in the same phrase together. If it said nursing as ministry, you would go, well, yeah, that's an avenue of ministry. Sure. If it said um, a lot of things... Uh, but business as ministry seems to be kind of a juxtaposition that it takes 
some people a long time to, to figure settle that out. That idea, yeah. yeah, to settle into that idea. Sure. Uh, so uh, you kind of filled in a, a bit of the gaps how uh, someone from Detroit um, ended up in Los Angeles and, and heading up Giving Keys. Uh, so, and, and how you initially started as, as a person was, uh, I think, taking that role of, of the production uh, manager, production manager. Yeah. So, um, no doubt God taught you lots, lots of things along the way. So as you took that position and then moved to a le- the leadership position, what is, what, what scared you the most about <laughs> that, about that? Too um, many things to name. About that thing. Um, yeah. What scared me the most about that? I think like messing up. That that's, just flat out failure. Yes. Messing up, making yeah. mistakes. Like this thing is too beautiful and I don't want to ruin it. Um, I think that was, that's a scary thought. Um, and I think for me that I just really wanted to be effective and be a good leader. And so can almost be a little paralyzing when you're young and moving into something and when you're moving into something that grows really fast. Like we did, we went from 300 K ish in 2012 to like eight and a half million in 2016. So it, it was like whew, grew really fast. And I remember one day Caitlin looking over at me and being like, did you ever think at 27 years old that you would be, the president of an $8 million company. And I was like, definitely no, no. definitely no. Um, But I think I, I think I knew it somewhere deep down that I wanted to end up there, but it actually happening is a totally different experience than having kind of this dream. Um, but I think, yeah, failing, so, well, failing is scary. So one of the things that you talked about was, Caitlin, in kind of what we'd call, you know, in, in entrepreneur talk, a pivot, right? So she was selling her CDs and, the, and these keys. Yeah. And, you know, uh, those of us that have been in the music business know that that business has completely changed. And yes. it's not really about the music. It's about the merch. Yeah. And the sale of merch. Yes. And so, uh, so she is selling CDs and has these, these keys and another pivot is like, oh, okay. And then you t- talked about another pivot where it was like she's, you know, instead of recording music and that, she's like making keys yeah. in the evenings and on the weekends so that she could sell this as merch and that. Sure. And then, but both of those things just happen serendipitously. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's super so organic. So what, what, what is that, how does that, is that a part of the story of giving keys and how have those pivots, like how have you and Caitlin stayed open to other like serendipitous opportunities and things? Is that a part of like the culture now mm. or is it, is it like, no, we've, we've become very, very businesslike and kind of, yeah, eight and a half million. It's like, uh, no, we have to, we have to, uh, function very differently than a startup. Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I think that inherently, like who in our personalities, Caitlin and I are both very open to new possibilities. And I think when you're in business too, you have to move where things are working. Like why would you continue to stay focused on projects that are not getting results? You test and you see what works and you keep moving in the direction of the things that are working. Um, so I think when you when your team grows... Uh, it can be a little more challenging because when you're, co- if you're constantly pivoting, your team's getting like whiplash and that doesn't make for a good culture. So as you get bigger, you have to take those things into consideration. Um, but I would say we still pivot often because we're in this process now of testing new product concepts and some of them work really well and some of them fall flat and then you've got to figure out where to invest your marketing dollars and your inventory spend to, to keep things chugging along. Yeah. All right. So I can ask uh, lots more questions, but I know that you may have some questions. So I want to, y- you to get ready with your, your questions um, kind of next. Um, 
So um, the area of homelessness was one that you saw as kind of you got had this aha moment in India as a 17 year old. I take it was that so tell us about so is that a ministry trip by a like a you know your dad's a pastor yeah the the church youth group is like okay we're going to India yeah uh, because our student population you know oftentimes their exposure to those realities is also mixed in with their their church experience it's their church that's actually helping to expose them to the issues of the day. Sure. Yeah, that was a a missions trip that I went on with, I think, like 15 other people I'd never met before. So we all applied to go on this trip that was called the Around the World Trip. And we went to London, India, and Thailand over the course of six weeks, seven weeks, um, and spent a lot of time working in orphanages, and doing more like service-driven projects, but yeah, it was it was a, a mission trip. Okay, questions. Questions from the group. Yes, Beth. I'm just wondering, you know, she started back before they started making all this money and really growing. What are the things that you learn most as a leader? What are the things you know you talked about that you were scared about? What are the things you've really taken away that has contributed to some of this? <sighs> a lot of things. A lot of lessons. Um, I think I've learned a lot about people management, um, building a healthy and effective culture is so central to a company's success. And in the early days, you're spending a lot of time just doing tasks. Cause it was like me, Caitlin and two other people. And it was like, we don't have time to like think about how to, how we're supposed to be interacting with each other, creating sort of like core values or a code of conduct or all these things that really matter to us now and we talk a lot about now. Um, So that transition from being kind of like a doer and an executor and being the person that was like making the partnerships happen or placing the orders or doing customer service or building the website to then a person who's managing people that are doing those things, that's a really big transition. And I think um, if you've got courses on that, take them seriously, (laughs) read the books. Um, Because especially again for young leaders who we haven't had the responsibility of of managing 75 people's well-being, it's a it's it's a lot. It's a big big responsibility. So I think a lot about people management and how to communicate and delegate effectively, um, and then a lot about really critical operational disciplines. And I think in a business like ours, inventory becomes a really um, like hairy big monster (laughs) that you have to figure out how to manage effectively. Um, So yeah, I mean, so many things, systems, like what, what programs and infrastructure to implement um, so much initially happens in like Google spreadsheets and emails. And then you've got to transition to project management systems and inventory management systems and ERPs. And it's, don't take those things for granted because they're very important. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, and I probably should have <laughs> But it looks like from this picture you created a culture um, at your organization. You can tell with them goofing around a little bit, and everybody looks happy, and that there's really love within your organization. Yeah. And so going from four people to this amount of people, how do, what do you think has been the most effective for you in building this type of culture? I think it's core values and keeping, like sticking to traditions. So things we did from the beginning that we still do, like Monday morning team meetings, and we cultivate a really interactive space for those team meetings where people get to share what they're experiencing, or we do shout outs, people get to kind of call out their colleagues that are doing a really amazing job at whatever project they're working on. The bell ringing ceremonies where we celebrate people's graduations, we do housewarming parties. Um, really like celebrating those milestones I think is crucial. Um, 
And then we talk about our core values a lot. So one of the exercises I'll like walk us through in our team meeting is, all right, let's we're gonna we're gonna center our shout outs this week around the core values. So why don't you sh shout someone out that's lived out one of our three core values? Um, so like keeping like repeating those things and making sure that they're talked about and not just on a piece of paper somewhere in a folder on someone's desk. Good. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. But how have you learned those? What resources have you used that really helped you to attain those skills? So I will say I am definitely not a perfect leader. Um, there's definitely been some really hard times and some days where I was like, wish I would have done that a little differently. Um, but I will say this, that this feels very true. My dad being a pastor and leading people for the majority of my life and doing that in a way that I really respect, like his leadership style, I felt like I got that modeled to me in a way that's unique and isn't everyone's experience. Um, so I really am grateful for my dad and, and what he demonstrated and my mom too. She was, my mom was really involved in the church and they even like co-pastored for a while. Um, so that, was really formative for me, but I just read a lot. And I spend a lot of time connecting with other people in the social impact space and other business leaders to be like, hey, I'm navigating this situation. Like, have you come up against this? How would you handle this? Um, and really inviting mentors into my life. So I have, I have three people that I could call like, and they would pick up immediately and walk me through something. So I, I couldn't do it by myself. Mentors, like educating yourself, and even peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, I think, are all really important. One great book recommendation? Uh, Tribal Leadership by Dave Logan is one of my favorites. Um, they talk about how do you build a, a core value-centered culture. Um, and then for businesses that don't necessarily have like such an obvious cause, how do you frame the like objective and goal of your work in a way that feels like a higher, nobler cause to really motivate people and keep them engaged? So that's a great one. Thanks. Yeah. Good. Good. Yes. Uh, my name's Phil. Hi, Phil. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious, like, how you guys are planning the you know, next set of, I mean, whether that be your next year or two years, um, next any amount of time. Sure. Like, what, is your, what is your strategy for kind of growing the, the next you know, percentage that you want to accomplish in the next quarter? So I would say we've, we had a few really lucky moments that we weren't anticipating and not forecasting for. And one of those was getting featured on ABC World News. And that was like an organic inbound lead. So David Muir and his team reached out to us saying, hey, we heard about you. People have been talking about you in our office. We'd love to come down and, and interview you. Um, at that point, we were doing like 80 grand a month on our website, and we did $222,000 in four days after that thing aired. And we never, we kind of, the new normal became like 120K a month, and we never dipped below that ever. Um, so those kinds of things are just like glorious, miraculous moments where you're like, oh my gosh, we don't have enough keys to fill these orders, but this is awesome. Um, but I would say a lot of it in the beginning was like very instinctual. Um, it was response, it was in response to customer feedback that we were getting because we were like doing a lot of events. One year we did 120 events where we were sending our team out. Caitlin and I were going out, it was like super grassroots. We're meeting people, we're hearing their stories, we're iterating the product based on the feedback. Um, at a certain point, and I would say that was in like end of 2016, we, or mid 2016, we were starting to realize, okay, this got to a place that surprised us all. <laughs> 
And we really have to start thinking about the business in a more long-term strategic way. Um, and that was a really big adjustment. And I don't think that we did that as effectively as we would hope. Um, meaning like the product planning, uh, I think we were chasing it a little bit. Now we've got a ton of stuff coming out and I think it's really working for us, but the way that we're testing and iterating the product now is much more data driven than it used to be. And um, basically all we do in our leadership meetings, Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings are sit and look at reports in silence together and then talk about what we <laughs> find and what decisions we think we should be making off of that. But that was like not how we operated for the first four years. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.